Doing something right when your opponents have to call themselves the basically the word feminist. I mean, in other words, what they're saying is they're for women. It's one of the reasons we are doing so well in elections. Welcome to PBS's To The Contrary. I'm Bonnie Urbay. Today we're having a conversation with the president and co-founder of the feminist majority, Eleanor Sumil. Ellie, you have been in the women's movement for a long time. Um, would you say that overall there has been progress? If so, in what areas? Spectacular progress, uh, really. When I started, um, 1970 really being active in now, so it's a long time ago. Um, women were like something like 3% of the lawyers and 8% of the doctors and, and, and medical school and, and law school. And, but it's not just that, just in college itself. Uh, now we're... Women, are, there are more women than men. I know, now we've gone from a minority status to a majority status. But uh, edu in education of all kinds, we're way ahead. Title IX and really the whole women's movement, pushing education, uh, saying everything's possible. Uh, and it, it changed an attitude. Uh, so nothing is, ab you know, women can go in any field. And there's enough of us in those fields, you don't feel like a stranger. So in education, it's been astonishing but also in employment. I mean, we're now virtually half of the workforce. We were just uh, about a third of the workforce, the paid workforce. Then in so many areas, we have had breakthroughs. I think one of the most exciting breakthroughs is the movement's now global. Before we get into where the movement is and, and uh, the globalization of everything, including the women's movement, uh, I asked you the question of how far have we progressed because we're in an era when most women's rights advocates, yourself certainly included, see women as being pushed backward by the White House. Well, there's uh, a backlash. I mean, this is not the first backlash we've gone through, by the way. It's been periodically. Um, I used to say that Ronald Reagan was a big recruiter for women's rights. Now we got Trump recruiting for us. I mean, it, well, and Susan Faludi wrote the book about the Reagan era, women in the Reagan era, called backlash, which was a huge bestseller at the time. Yeah. So this is not the first time we're in a backlash right now. Uh, they're trying to undo the employment laws, and regulations. Uh, they're trying to uh, undermine Title IX. They're even trying to undermine Title IX's ability to fight sexual assault and sexual harassment on campus. But I see it as uh, a weakness in a way, because basically, it is a backlash to our front lash, to our forward movement, and it's never been successful. And I think this won't either. Really? You know, well, tell me about the damage that is being done to uh, women's the act, What you talked about, for example, um, I do believe that Secretary DeVos was able to rescind the Obama-era regulation on how colleges and schools should deal with Title IX, but not, are, not totally. She wasn't able to rescind the whole thing. Okay, so tell me about the act, these th things like this. Right, right. What happened in, on Title IX dealing with sexual assault and sexual harassment, she offered uh, guidelines that could lessen the standard, make it much more difficult for women to pursue a case. But a college still could follow what the Obama administration suggested. And by the way, they are. It's not a, a, a total picture. Uh, why? because of the demands of students themselves. There's a huge women's movement on campuses, and they have demanded and are winning better procedures and practices. So even though, they, as I say, they're trying to make it on an even table for women, they're, making, they're suggesting a harder way to go, but the reality is some universities, because of the demands of their students, are not taking that option. And so I feel that, that when the women themselves are ignited, they know what a good and fair procedure is and they're demanding them. And so I think that even there, although they're not, you know, 
they're going in the wrong direction. The administration is trying to undo. It's not without a struggle. But let's talk about where they've successfully uh, planned parenthood. Well, again, they try to defund Planned Parenthood, but right, they but haven't you, succeeded in it. In but certain they have, states, though. Yeah. In some states, they've made it very hard for access to not only abortion, but birth control itself. So there is no question that that is a struggle. And it's an unnecessary one. This just is injuring young women for no good reason. Uh, but there is certainly still forward movement because more and more people are galvanizing you know, Planned Parenthood is growing, and it's growing because people, women especially, want access to sexual and reproductive health services. Well, and what about the chemical abortion revolution, too? Has, has that worked in, um, well, of in course. young uh, women's favor? Absolutely. Uh, Mifepristone are the uh, early option for an ab abortion, something like 40% of abortions of that early stage are now performed with pills. Uh, that's not just the United States, that's worldwide. It would be more if in fact there wasn't so many artificial barriers. But the fact is, it is an easier form and women are demanding services. All right, other areas where, um, again, the government is maybe uh, ha has um, is trying to move in a direction that you see as against women. Right. But, One Another area that they're trying to move backwards on is affirmative action in both education and in employment. Um, and so we have a hostile Supreme Court that keeps on narrowing it. Uh, this is a, a very troublesome thing. Not only are they trying to fight affirmative action, they're trying to fight organizing. And, and just remember, when they say they're attacking and narrowing the organizing rights of public employees, the majority of them are women. For example, in teaching, when you say that you're not going to allow teachers to organize, make it harder for them to organize, you're hurting women. We're over 70% of elementary and secondary teachers. But the exciting thing, Bonnie, and this is the exciting thing, Teachers have taken it on to themselves. They've been uh, organi uh, r rallying in West Virginia. Whoever thought that this movement would start in West Virginia, Arizona, Oklahoma. I mean, teachers are saying, we're not going to take it anymore because when you cut us, you're cutting kids. You you're don't have decent books. I mean, supposedly the most advanced, richest country in the world, and we're using 25-year-old science books? Teachers are just one example, the AFT, NEA. American Federation of Teachers, National Education Association. What are they trying to do? Get reasonable pay. So in some of these states, they hadn't gotten a raise in 10 years, for heaven's sakes. They're now organizing. I mean, you know, they just didn't sit and take it because we're calling it seeing red. They're just, they're, they're tired of it. They want the, the kids to get a better education. That means you cannot keep on cutting educational funding. And they want teachers to be paid a respectable amount. You're talking about 70% of teachers are women. What about public employees? Because they're trying to public cut public employees' unions right. across public the board. Yeah, SEIU. There are, yes, I mean, we're disproportionately in the public zone. So you're, you're, you're attacking women, and you're attacking people whose services we need desperately. So um, we know one thing. Without labor union organizing, wages go down. And not only rages, the services themselves go down. So there's going to be a big fight back. That's what I'm saying is they're trying to push us back, but it isn't like the public is going to take it. In fact, I think people will organize more and more. Now let's talk about the word feminism. Uh, it was in huge favor in the early days of second wave feminism, um, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and then there was, as you mentioned, a backlash with Reagan. But also, I remember Rush Limbaugh, the right-wing commentator, saying that feminists were feminazis. And uh, there was a period when it went out of favor. Well, uh, have you played a part in bringing it, because you run the Feminist Majority Foundation, being, bringing it back into favor? Because now, everybody, people are selling clothes by being feminists. I mean, they're, it's being used to sell all kinds of products. We started 30 years ago, Feminist Majority. Now we're over 30 years old. 
uh, we were determined to show that we indeed were a majority of women. And now it's everywhere. And people, as you said, entertainers are using it. Beyonce, you know, did a whole tour with the word feminist in the background. But it, it's uh, very popular among the young. And there are even now conservatives who call themselves Absolutely. conservative feminists. Absolutely. What do you think about that? Do you welcome them into the movement? Well, you know one thing. You're doing something right when your opponents have to call themselves the basically the word feminist. I mean, in other words, what they're saying is they're for women. And um, we'll see how much. Although I think that we have surprise. It's one of the reasons we are doing so well in elections. Uh, when, a, when a woman puts out there that she's fighting for women's rights, she does better. There's no question. And right now, I mean, you must know this, Bonnie, a record number of women are running. And so we're cracking another glass ceiling. Even though we didn't quite get the highest of glass ceilings, there's now women running at the local level, state level, county level, and for Congress than ever before. How long do you think it will be before, um, before another woman runs and I think it's gets be, elected? I think it's going to be sooner than you expect. No one can predict a, an event like that. But uh, I know one thing, our numbers are going up. They're only going in one direction. And, and, and what really surprised, I think, every one of us looking at this is Hillary Clinton loses. The reaction was overwhelming. The biggest marches in the history of the human race simultaneously on one day. Uh, as you know, millions of people ran. We had over 696 marches in this country alone, but it went on all seven continents and worldwide. People said that if she can lose the most qualified and we see what can win, well, hey, I'm going to run myself. And it, it had the absolute opposite effect. Instead of thinking if she won, more women would run, be encouraged, it was just the reverse. The anger propelled people into running and, and for all kinds of offices. But there, a lot of women have also won uh, nominations, in, uh, party nominations, in situations where they're probably not going to win the general. Do you yeah, see? Yeah, but you know what? You can't predict this anymore. This is a crazy time. Women ran in, in, on the Democratic ticket in strong Republican uh, places where committee chairs were there. They got elected. Fifteen people broke through, 11 of them feminist women. And if you had looked and just tried to predict it on the pass, you never would have predicted it. Uh, they, they knocked on doors. They did all the old-fashioned groundwork and it made the difference. But they were propelled by that energy of outrage. They want change. And by the way, our candidates, uh, people, these women running, they're spectacular. They're professors they're in colleges. They're um, you know, women who have done, worked in nonprofits, women who are very educated and very, in a, lot of, a lot of variety, not just your cookie cutter, uh, normal uh, in the past politician, but people who are very versed in science, and math, and uh, helping people. It's quite an exciting time. So which women do you see running for president in 2020? Well, uh, I, I, I don't Harris, want to... Senator Harris, <laughs> Senator Gillibrand. Let's put it this way. There's so many of them you can hardly you know, want to zero in right now. Right now I want to well, look at 2018. Well, throw some names out there for me. Well. I mean, all the senators are, are, are looking at it, obviously. Um, I think it's going to... You're, you're saying all the Democratic female senators, yes, right? Yes. yes. Okay. I mean, there's, there's uh, senators looking at it. There'll soon be governors looking at it. Right now, there's at least a dozen women that are running for governor. Uh, we have Stacey Abrams, who could be the first African-American governor uh, from a southern state, Georgia, for, for any state for that matter, uh, and their, their qualifications are stunning. I mean, like uh, Stacey Abrams is, uh, is just a, uh, a star. I mean, in everything she's done, you know, she now has a master's in public administration, all A's, then it goes into a law, successful in a law degree, a, a career, successful in business, it becomes the first minority leader uh, of the House in, as a Democrat in, in Georgia. I mean, these people are not ordinary, uh, these women. 
and they're very spectacular. She's one. There's many running. Uh, and we never had that many women running for governor, so it's a new day. You have done a lot of work with young women. Tell me about, and, and I wonder sometimes if that was a factor in, in turning around the view, the public view of the word feminist. Well, Tell me about the, <laughs> about the college work you do. Yeah, we, we, we decided when we started that we were going to specialize in youth programs. And so we're on somewhere around 600 colleges uh, in all 47 states now with feminist groups. And when we're not there, other groups are there. What we did is we made it popular to organize among the young. They were used to, people used to say, well, you don't have your daughters, you don't have the young. We knew you did, but we also knew our movement wasn't investing enough in it. So we showed it could be done, and now many groups are doing it, which is very good. I mean, sometimes on a college campus, there's five or six women's groups. And, they're, and we're in community colleges, state colleges, private universities, graduate schools, it doesn't matter. Uh, so now we have branched out into high school. And so now we're in high schools, uh, we're in 32 states now in high schools. Uh, and that model we're using there is human rights and, and teaching global women's rights. I mean, it, it's, it's, they're very educational. And then there's women's studies in uh, high school. I was going to ask you what, how much a role women's studies, which started, what, in the 70s? Yeah, it started uh, in 1971, I think. Um, and, uh, and women's studies now is in um, almost all the schools. I mean, it's just unbelievable the number of children, a number of students, I shouldn't say children because we're talking high school and college, uh, that are participating, tens of thousands, and every year males and females. Um, in fact, some of our, our campus groups have uh, male heads. I mean, you know, they're, they're into it. <laughs> um, so basically, women's studies has made people see um, history and political science and uh, English literature and writing and ma media. I can go through all the different areas. They see it now through a different lens. And I think it creates a new confidence among fem young feminist women and young feminist men that we can change the world in which everybody gets to reach their full potential. Do you see, because you're saying this is a really successful avenue for building uh, feminist momentum, do you see the right wing as as maybe coming after women's studies programs? Oh, they've some? been coming after us. They have the right, been. Oh, How? my goodness. The right wing has been coming out trying to, to end women's studies, trying to end uh, black studies, Chicano studies, LGBT studies. They're trying to end anything that's showing the, the, the what I would say the full potential of the human race. But it's not successful. A chancellor came in uh, at the uh, University of North Carolina system and tried to close down women's studies. Guess what happened? The students protested. So you, 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 you it is, it's like trying to, you know, go backwards on, in science. And, you know, once you know that the world is round, you know the world's round. <laughs> you know what I mean? It is hard to undo it. Except that there, are, there's a whole movement now saying that science is inaccurate science, you know, about climate change, that well, the, not believing science. Well, that's obviously, the la every time science has been challenged from a ideological point, science wins. You know that. As I said, the world's round. The first scientist that said the world's round. Oh, the sun isn't, you know, the earth isn't the center of the universe. I mean, who won? <laughs> I bet on scientists every time. And as you know, and we all know, climate is changing. Now, since you organize on college campuses, and actually I remember a couple of years ago you did, if not last year, you did a, an event at the National Press Club about campus assault. That seems to be college women's biggest issue, I would think, right? Well, it is. It, it is a serious issue. Um, you know, the various statistics, one in five college women are, are attacked sexually. Uh, none of the, the data is really complete, though. There's not been enough studying on it. But here's another area where young women are, uh, and men, but mostly women, are organizing. It isn't something they're just taking. Uh, there's a whole movement on campus uh, that has uh, 
for survivors and, for, and, and, and people who have not yet been attacked. In other words, people are gathered, women are students, are not taking it. Um, I think it's very serious and it has to end. Uh, and it's, it's a shame that the DeVos administration has uh, tried to go backwards. You're talking the Secretary of Education. Yes, yeah, Secretary of Education is trying to go backwards, but I believe it's only going to go in one direction. These are serious charges. Uh, and it's not, come on, why should you make it easier to, to commit assault? This is just ludicrous. Well, a lot of the, there's a backlash too from men who feel they've been, who say they've been falsely accused. Well, no one um, wants anybody to be falsely accused, but we do know that is a very tiny part of the problem. The real problem is the assaults in the first place. So I, I believe that, um, that there will be more justice. And, but, you know, justice isn't achieved until there's demand. And, I, and the women aren't quitting school. They're determined to stay there. They're determined to have a safe environment. And I think they will. They're running for student government heads. They're changing the process of how you report. Um, science is helping with DNA kits and, and um, rape kits and, and uh, ways to, to uncover, uh, and to, well, to discover the truth. Um, but the most important thing is, it's the state of mind. Women are not taking it. That's when they're saying enough is enough. They've had it, and they intend to have a more friendly environment. Do you see the colleges resisting or acquiescing to taking it more seriously? Well, there's never, you know, all, in other words, there's some that are changing, and they see the handwriting on the wall. Uh, there's others who resist. There's fraternities that resist. There's, uh, you know, sports clubs that resist. Uh, but I think the Tell wise me about one that. sports. How how well because there's know, been a sports. lot of assault from athletes, and uh, and so they feel that they are going to organize to make it harder to prove the are, assaults. Are they the problem? Uh, something seems to have changed on campus, either. The assault was happening at the same rate 40, 50 years ago and nobody talked about it, or it just wasn't going on at the same rate. Why do you think there is such a high rate of sexual assault, not just on campus really, but uh, uh, among young women, you know, by largely men uh, against well, young women? Well, there's a couple of theories. One is that since more women are reporting, you now know it's a problem. When it was hushed up, it wasn't the same thing. And there is more people reporting. There is more people who, uh, they don't feel shame. They're just, they want this problem to end. Remember, women were uh, made to feel it was their fault. They aren't fooled anymore. They understand it isn't their fault. Um, so basically, I think part of it is just reporting is higher. But uh, part of it is also, the, these universities have become so large. And, and I, I say the universities are not taking enough responsibility. They know what things are going on. They have to take more responsibility. That's all there's to it. They can't just collect you know, tuition and present education in the classroom. They have a, uh, a responsibility for the culture that is being set. And then, frankly, they shouldn't have a culture that that it has a hostile environment for girls or women, students. They, they just can't, this is no longer acceptable. So I, I think it is, um, I'm hopeful uh, because I see a movement that I don't think is turning back. Um, and, and it's justice. Uh, the worst thing could happen is women say, well, that's it, I won't be educated, it's too not safe. Well, they're not saying that, no way. They're gonna make it safer. Thank you so much, Eleanor Smeal, Ellie Smeal, um, co-founder of the Feminist Majority Foundation, longtime women's rights activist. Uh, really appreciate your perspective on all these issues. Thank you. That's it for this edition. Please follow me on Twitter and visit our website, pbs.org slash to the contrary. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next week. Thank you.